welcome back to Everod Junction. In this video I'm going to focus on the track laying and I'll show you the, uh, the process and uh, what I'm doing uh, to get the track around the room. Now the process I'm going through is relatively long-winded and there's certain things in it that you may not be interested in doing um, but hopefully uh, you'll get some ideas and inspiration all the same. So uh, as you can see in the background I've already laid the fast lines. <laughs> All of the track, including the cork base that it is attached to, is all glued down. Um, I used to uh, use track pins, um, but uh, this time I've decided to glue everything instead. I'm using copy decks, which is quite a popular glue in Britain for doing sort of craft and hobby work. It has similar properties to contact adhesives, that being you sort of let it go off and then apply the, uh, the two surfaces together. Um, but it's also not the strongest glue in the world, which is quite handy, so should I make a mistake or change my mind, um, this can all be pulled up. So there's the track for the uh, fast lines. You can see I've put it on a, a reasonably thick um, bed of cork. Um, I think it's about four millimetres thick. Um, I'll buy the cork in rolls off of eBay as opposed to buying it from model shops as uh, buying it in bulk off eBay is quite a lot cheaper. Um, the sort of model railway branded cork um, tends to be a little bit more expensive. The only reason I've used cork is to just give the uh, track a little bit of a raised appearance off of the, uh, the main baseboard. You'll notice in the real world that uh, the track is uh, higher um, where it's sort of sitting and then the ballast, the stones that hold it in, um, they taper off and drop down to the edges and even between tracks. Um, so just for realism I have raised it on some cork. Um, if you don't want to and you're not bothered about everything being super realistic you can just put the track straight on the baseboard. And then again as I mentioned earlier by gluing everything you can see there's no visible track pins or anything. The track is just sitting there nicely and it looks like it would in the real world. And of course, as I've mentioned in previous videos, you can see I've respaced the sleepers on the track. Um, that's what's taking the longest. Um, it is quite involved and chews up a lot of time, but I'm really pleased with how it's looking. It certainly looks a hell of a lot better than the track looks when you just get it straight out of the box. Another reason for spacing out the track is I am using some of their new bullhead stuff and the uh, incorrectly spaced concrete track does look very strange next to the correctly spaced bullhead track. So to uh, get rid of that strange appearance, I'm having to modify these concrete sleeper sections of track. Okay, here's how to uh, respace the uh, sleepers. It's a simple process, but it's extremely tedious and repetitive if you have to do a lot of it. Um, if you're going to go and head and do it and you have a large layout, then you have my sympathy. Um, but uh, I understand some of you will be interested in how to do this, so I will show you. Okay, first thing to do is to flip over the track. Obviously I'm just using a very small piece, but uh, the pieces you'll be using are, I'm sure will be a lot bigger. Um, and you need to cut the webbing that holds all the sleepers together. Okay, uh, all the sleepers now are uh, loose. Let me move around. Uh, make sure you get rid of all the bits of webbing. So another bit of plastic there. A um, couple of sleepers at the end here that I have not bothered to cut because they're surplus because I'm going to be increasing the spacing so I can chuck those. Um, useful for a bit of line side detail or something so I've got a pot where I've kept all of them. Uh, so now all you need to do is uh, space out the sleepers and uh, I told you it was tedious and now you're going to see why. Now you can get jigs to do this there is a guy who makes jigs for them, but to be honest, I've done it so much that I can just do it by eye. You can see how much greater the uh, spacing is over what the track would be like straight out of the box. We'll uh, compare it to another bit in a second. Okay, that's, a, that's roughly about what you want. Uh, you want about 5mm between each one roughly speaking, do some research and find out what sleeper spacing is appropriate for your layout. Um, five millimeters is okay for me, five to six millimeters anyway. As I said, I do it all by eye. And once you've done it, they will move around a little bit. But uh, there you go, that is respaced. Now, if you're doing straight track, then um, you can uh, turn it over and you can uh, put some glue along here to hold them in place. If you're going around a gentle curve, then maybe you can glue along the side, just one side. You glue both sides, it locks it straight, it won't bend anymore. Um, I personally found that it was much easier not to glue it at all, just to leave it alone, flip it over, put it on the layout, 
and then as I bent it and moved it around depending on what it was going to do I then went along manually afterwards and just quickly readjusted any that were slightly out like I'm doing now and that's roughly the process um, you can see it, it takes a hell of a long time but uh, it does look quite a bit better um, and more realistic there's a, a rough side by side comparison again I've only uh, respace this one just roughly here on the bench as an example but already you can see the difference when you compare it to standard double O scale track straight from the box okay so it's time to get started um, what I do first obviously is lay down the cork um, I apply some copy decks to both sides that being the cork and the baseboard top and then just like a contact adhesive you want to wait for it to uh, sort of go off um, as you can see this stuff is about ready as it's uh, going clear in most places so that's now ready to stick down okay the cork is now uh, glued down but the glue is not completely dried yet um, so before I lay any track over the top of it it's a good idea just to weight the cork down make sure it dries absolutely flat as all of the track and cork is being glued it's very handy to have some weights and some pieces of timber lying around so that you can weight everything down as you go as long as the weather is reasonably warm and you've allowed the copy decks to partially dry before applying the cork to the baseboard um, it won't take very long for this to completely dry um, so what I do is I move on and I cut the, uh, the cork for the next section put down the, uh, the glue and then start waiting for that to go clear and when that's gone clear and you're ready to put the cork down in this location you can move the board and the, and the weights to the next area this area will have dried already in the time it's taken to prepare this section. Preparing the cork is easy. As I said, I'm buying it off eBay in rolls. And uh, just uh, take yourself with a, uh, a ruler, get yourself a blade. I'm cutting it by eye because I've done so many pieces. I know basically, just through doing it so many times, how wide the cork needs to be. There you go, there's another strip ready for installation, so you can just mass produce those on, in a big batch if you want. Um, do the same for corners. A lot of people will go, oh, I'm going around a corner, and they'll take their piece of track and they'll lay it over and they'll, they'll sort of try and cut the corner out of the cork, and then this bit gets wasted and that bit gets wasted. You don't need to, just cut a strip, and if you're going around a tight corner, cut this strip down the middle again, and you'll see me doing it later, and it will bend around the corner. You can see already. It bends a little bit and then it gets to a certain point and doesn't want to. So cut it down there again and it will bend even more. And then you use the entire roll and you don't waste anything. I'm cutting the cork just a fraction wider than the width of the track. Um, so it's about 35 millimeters, uh, something along those lines. You haven't got to be super accurate. Um, that's what I've gone for. As I said, I'm doing most of it by eye, so it will vary in places as we go around the layout. But again, that all adds to that sort of realistic appearance. Um, you know, six miles of railway is not going to be absolutely perfect all the way along its length. You want some variation. And again, you can see by having the track raised up from the baseboard, the ballast as it goes over the edge you'll get a nice uh, ballast shoulder this whole board is going to be uh, where the station is um, and on the uh, relief lines that we're now laying um, I'm going to have a little bit of point work towards the end of the station so now is a good time to uh, double check exactly where I want to put it because once I've laid the cork down I don't really want to tear it up because I end up realizing I've made a mistake the point work at the end of the station is quite simple it's just a single slip and a left hand point um, that leads into the reversing siding which will end up being between the main and the relief lines. It's only accessible from the relief lines and uh, I've done that because the relief lines will be the ones that will be running the DMUs and the shorter trains that are going to be 
wanting to use the reversing siding. Trains on the express uh, or the main lines um, will be uh, main line services, won't need to use the reversing siding at all. What the reversing siding is, is basically a means for uh, local services that have reached the end of their scheduled uh, service, so that their last stop. Um, it allows them to uh, turn around and go the other way and it's used uh, for DMUs or uh, rolling stock that has a cab at either end. So this is basically um, what it does. You can see the class 121 on the left hand side. Imagine it's just stopped at the station, um, the service is finished, it's not going any further, all the passengers have got off. The uh, unit ideally needs to return back to where it came from in the other direction, take passengers into London or from London you know, or whatever, depends on where your layout is set. So there it is, it's stopped, passengers are all off it, just the driver remains. It then brings the unit into the reversing siding and then changes cabs. So he's now got out of his seat and gone to the, uh, the back of the unit into the second cab. And then when the line is clear, the point work allows him to get back onto the slow lines or the relief lines, but in the other direction. It stops at the station again, he's now at the beginning of his service, picks up the first few passengers, goes back the way he came. That's what a reversing siding allows you to do. It's just a little bit of operational interest um, rather than just watching the trains go around and round all the time. If you're a regular viewer, you'll know that there's going to be a branch line and that branch line will terminate in a bay platform and it will be in the foreground along the frontal edge here. Now, uh, using some point work that I've got, um, basically behind the camera on the other side of the curve, I'll be able to do exactly what I've just shown you, but for units coming the other way. So I'll almost have two reversing sidings. So you can see why it's important to get the point work in the right place because the whole appearance of this entire area is going to depend on the, uh, the placement of the point work. Um, bring it too far this way, the corners coming off it are going to be far too tight, they won't work, they won't look right with the smooth main lines in the background. Um, bring it too far back and you uh, are going to have significantly shorter station platforms because they're going to be restricted um, by this uh, siding as it comes off. So you've got to find a nice compromise on where you're going to be able to put it. Um, it's a model railway and you're working in a room so you're never going to be able to do exactly what you want but you can always uh, work a little bit before committing to laying it to get the best possible solution. Okay, I've uh, basically decided uh, where the point work's going to go. You can see the, uh, the main lines, they start their curve very, very gently over here in the background and the geometry of the crossing and the, uh, the point here, um, they're perfectly straight. So I've uh, decided to go for a dead straight run of track from the slight curve at the end over there. Okay, I'll leave those until they go tacky and then uh, glue them down and then move on to the curve. Okay, I've stuck the cork down and again moved the piece of wood with the weights um, to this area as the uh, area we did earlier has now dried. Before I start laying the cork for the curves, what I will now do is lay the track from the fiddle yard through the station up to the uh, crossing, as you can see there. Um, and that will then govern what the track is going to do exactly and where it comes off the crossing. Because remember there's going to be a siding in the middle. So I'm not exactly sure how the cork's going to want to flow. So I'll lay the track first.
the uh, first piece laid down. So as you can uh, probably tell, it takes quite a while, but uh, the end result is worth all the effort. It does look good. You saw, of course, I wired in the, uh, the droppers uh, for the DCC. I'm putting one of those on every single section. So you can see there's the other two for the uh, main lines. And I'll try and keep them in the same place so that they'll all connect to the uh, same point on the bus wires. Okay, so that's uh, the track laid up to uh, the site of where the crossing is going to be. And uh, of course, I'm sure you've worked it out by now, um, it's best to uh, put the track down straight away while the glue is still wet um, so that you can move it about, fine tune it and make sure you're absolutely happy with the final position. If you wait for the glue to go tacky as soon as you put set it uh, down onto the cork, it's very difficult to adjust any sleepers or move the uh, curvature of the track about. So I do it when it's uh, wet and the glue hasn't started to dry and just by leaving the weights on for about an hour or so ensures that uh, the track glues itself nicely to the cork. Okay, so I've just been uh, marking out where the various holes need to be for the, uh, the slip and uh, it requires two point motors and as you can see there's, there's four wires coming off of it as well. So uh, that wire is the polarity for the point motor or the frog on this end. That wire is for the polarity on this end and then these two are a power feed from the DCC so uh, I need to drill holes for all of those. I also need to drill a hole for the uh, point motor arms themselves and to mark those what I do is I just lay the lay the thing out in its final position and then just uh, pop a, a very fine marker pen through the hole where the point motor will go and that then marks where the uh, where the point motor is going to be. Okay, so there's the holes for the wires, and then the hole for the point motors I always make those a bit bigger, so that's about 13 millimeters that hole, just to allow a little bit of margin for error. We're just reading the instructions, you can see it says all rails to adjoining tracks need to be connected with insulating joiners which I suspected so luckily I did buy some when I bought the points so I put those on and uh, that will be the case for every every piece of track that it is connected to from its four exits um, that's why it's got its own power supply it is effectively its own environment it doesn't have any con physical connection to the uh, the tracks that are attached to it We'll cover the wiring for it in greater detail in a future video, um, but for now just uh, make sure you read the instructions when you're laying the track and uh, install the insulating uh, joiners where necessary. Just to answer any quick questions some of you may have with regards to uh, these two, um, the observant of you may have noticed that obviously the sleeper spacing on these is closer together. Um, now that isn't so much of a problem on point work as the sleeper spacing on point work is usually different and closer anyway, so it's not a huge problem. Um, in future I will be uh, using these, the Pico bullhead points. You can see the, uh, the, the sleepers are a bit further apart, so they're obviously going to look a bit nicer. And the rail is a lot finer as well, even finer than Code 75. Um, at the moment all Pico offer are the large radius points in the uh, new bullhead format. Um, so uh, things like this uh, single slip um, are only available in Code 100 or Code 75. Now Pico will eventually be releasing a bullhead version of this crossing and uh, they have made it clear that it will be of exactly the same geometry. So what I will do is I will install this crossing as it is with this point because the two sort of match each other looks a bit neater than having perhaps one of them and, and then that. Um, but I will install these two and then when the time comes and the Pico range has been updated with uh, increased uh, choice in point work I will uh, pull these out and replace them. Um, everywhere else on the layout I'm pretty sure I won't be having any crossings so I can make use of the new large radius bullhead points which do look very nice. Yeah, you may also have noticed that these are obviously of wooden sleeper construction and the lines I'm laying are of concrete type. Well, uh, 
that's uh, actually quite normal and uh, indeed was the norm for about 40 years. It's only recently, uh, recently as in the last sort of 10 to 15 years, that uh, concrete sleeper points have started to appear on the network. There were earlier cases of it, but they were relatively rare. Um, but it is starting to become more mainstream now. Um, for the era I'm modelling, 1980s, wooden points and even bullhead type points with concrete flat bottom track was basically the norm and you should do it to make your layout look uh, uh, correct if you're modeling this period and again to make things look more correct for the period um, the siding that's coming off of here will be using the bullhead track and not the concrete flat bottom style track again for a bit of interest and a bit of difference but also to remain true to the prototype um, even today, you get a train at just about anywhere, sidings along the side of the uh, route that you are travelling are still, in a lot of places, bullhead track. And then of course for the, uh, the reasons I've just explained, um, it's quite possible this point, or this crossing will get replaced with a new type eventually, so I will not glue it down probably just pop in a couple of track pins just to keep it secure. laying the bullhead in more detail later on when I lay the branch line. Um, it is certainly not aimed for the beginner, it is much more fiddly than even the Code 75 track. As an example, here are the joiners. They look very realistic, but they're a bit of a pain to fit. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put this uh, small radius left hand point in here to transfer onto the relief lines and this will also act as a trap point. A trap point or catch point is a very important piece of safety equipment that you see on the railway a lot. Um, let's uh, give you a situation. Here is uh, a locomotive in the siding. Um, something's wrong with it and for whatever reason without a driver or anyone's permission it begins to roll slowly out of the yard or the siding in this case. If there was no catch point it would roll out onto the relief lines and cause a serious accident. Um, so what they do in the real world is they use points or even cut down versions of points that look considerably smaller, uh, something a little bit like this. You might see those as opposed to a full-fledged point. Um, but by having that point set to the straight ahead position, a small section of track and some buffers, the locomotive or whatever it is that's come loose will roll across the points at slow speed and then just bump into the buffers at the end. Um, it will cause quite a lot of paperwork and finger pointing but no one will get killed. So it's an important feature to represent in the model um, just to add that extra layer of realism. I've got a nice smooth junction up here, but uh, I have deliberately pushed it as far as I can to the end of this board to maximize the length of the station. And in doing so, you can see we have an issue with the geometry. My nice uh, reversing siding is not going to connect up to the small point. Now, I could use a tighter point, I could use something like a set track point, but that's actually much too aggressive and I end up with the opposite problem and it, it curves too far around like that. And also a set track point doesn't look as, as good as a streamlined one. So I'll show you a little trick to get around these problems. 
it is quite possible to bend points and get more curvature out of them, or less, depending on what you're doing. This is a Pico left-hand streamline small point, and what I've done is along the straight edge of the rail, you can see I've cut the webbing between the sleepers. Just used an ordinary modelling knife and only did it down that side. That then means that uh, the plastic sleepers that are holding all of this in geometry um, will now bend a little bit and I'll be able to get that little extra bit of curvature out of the point to make the, uh, the connection possible. So as you can see, it's not going to make the turn, but with a little bit of bending. Okay, the point works in uh, to connect the uh, the different types of track together. So to connect the flat bottom rail to the ball head rail, you can just use these standard flat bottom rail joiners that you've been used to for a number of years. Um, and indeed, um, if you do get some of the new ball head track and you find these uh, ball head joiners to be far too fiddly, um, you can indeed just use ordinary Code 75 flat bottom joiners to join it all together. As you saw, I've also uh, soldered on a, a power feed to the point to ensure that everything is going to be nice and reliable. I'm doing my best to not rely on the rail joiners for conductivity of electricity around the various parts of the layout. As in my experience with the old layout over the years, as the rails expand and contract um, due to ambient temperature conditions, these, um, these connections eventually uh, stop working. So now I'm going to continue laying the relief lines and uh, next thing to do is to start adding the banking or the super elevation to the curves. Banking the curves is a nice realistic feature to add to the layout and I did use it on the previous layout and I thought it looked very good um, so I'm continuing to do it on this one. You can see the reversing siding in the foreground which is just laid flat as it's a dead end siding there's no need for any banking. Um, you can see the difference in the profile between the, the siding and the concrete track in the back. You can see the track in the background is banked when you send a train through, it just looks that little bit better. The banking I'm doing is purely visual. I've not uh, calculated exactly what the banking should be for this radius of curve or anything like that. Um, as this is a model, um, doing that level of detail is arguably not necessary. You just need something that's visual, that the, uh, the viewer of the layout is going to be able to notice. Um, if the banking is too subtle, then you won't see it, and arguably, if you can't see it, there's no point putting it down. Um, so I've gone for something that you can actually see when the train goes around. So there's only really two basic rules. Make sure you can physically see the banking, otherwise it's pointless doing it. And when you do the banking, at the beginning of the curve, start the banking off gently, and then slowly build it up to the height that you wish to bank the track by. To start the banking off nice and gently, I'm just using some plastic card, and then the bulk of the banking is made up just using some basic matchsticks. You can achieve the banking using anything you want. Some people use paper, um, some people buy products off the shelf, um, whatever you want to do. As long as it banks the track and starts off gently, you'll be fine. I'm just using these bits because I have them lying around and they haven't cost me anything. So we start off with a short section of half a millimetre tall plastic card. That then moves up to one millimetre. And then on top of that, 
another half a millimetre and then that transitions nicely onto a matchstick. Again, this is entirely up to you on how you do it. You can uh, have a very short, aggressive transition into the full banking or something much longer than this. It's entirely up to you. As usual, I'll be using some copy decks to uh, stick it down. So take away the plastic card from the edge. And then just run a nice bit of copy decks around the edge or whatever adhesive you've decided to use. One thing I like about the copy decks is if you uh, make a mistake and you put uh, some copy decks onto a piece of track next to where you're working, uh, once it's dry it will just peel off and not leave any marks. Now do the same to the plastic card itself. And then once this uh, copy deck has uh, dried so it's tacky, I can uh, put the banking onto the cork and it will uh, stick down nicely. gluing the matchstick so I prefer to just uh, put the glue straight down put the matchstick straight down and then wait every single one of them until they dry just seems to work a little bit better than leaving the glue to go tacky okay I've been busy laying more and more track and now this line gets all the way around this corner so over on this section I've decided to add in some more point work um, and this will facilitate um, access to the bay platform from the relief lines. So a DMU can come around the layout in this direction and it can go across the point work, which then puts it on the branch, into the station, stop, terminate the service, and then it can come back out. And if needs be, it can either go along the branch line or it can actually get back out onto the uh, relief lines. So it kind of mirrors the functionality of the reversing siding over on the other side where the station is. And again, for scenic interest, I've deliberately changed the style of the junction. So there's no crossing this time. It's just a series of point work um, laddering across the lines um, just to provide a bit of visual interest and difference over on this part of the layout. Because again, I don't want forced symmetry and that typical model railway sort of appearance of set geometry curves and the same type of points all over the place trying to make it look real so let's say this junction is old and the one over there with the crossing in it has been laid more recently something like that trying to create a little bit of a story here and of course I've shown you previously but uh, these are the new Pico bullhead points and I think you'll agree they do look quite impressive they do look very nice four of them in this location it's going to look uh, excellent, I think. Another reason why I decided to uh, go with this style of junction. I've respaced yet another section of flexi track. This is really getting old now, but uh, I'm going to keep going because it does look so much better. But trust me, if, if you do decide to do it, uh, you're in for the long haul, especially on a layout this size. This is taking ages. <laughs>
I've made uh, quite a bit more progress. Just laying the junction here now. Very pleased with how these new points are looking. They do look considerably better than anything that's gone before in the ready to run range. I'll just quickly show you how I'm achieving the, uh, the spacing of the track around the curves. Um, the curve varies in its radius as it goes around, so uh, deciding where the next track is going to go can be a little fiddly. Spacing of the track has been uh, decided on two factors, that is uh, what looks quite close to the real thing and also what is actually uh, doable on this layout. Um, so obviously the biggest thing to take into account is the clearances of the coaches going around the curves. And you can see I've got these about as close together as I can get away with without having any issues with vehicles crashing into each other. That width is uh, the width that you get by joining two streamlined points together. Um, so it is a little bit too wide to be true to scale. Um, but actually if I was to narrow the gap between the two tracks, those coaches wouldn't get around that corner. So i am had to make a compromise with what's actually uh, doable on the layout. Between the main and relief lines, got a slightly bigger gap. Um, that's just a, been a, a visual gap that I've added in just to make it look a little bit more like the real thing. There's quite a few places where the two lines are separated by a little bit more space. But uh, it's not based on any real dimensions, it's just been done on a what looks good basis and what will actually fit on the board. So I've laid the, uh, the cork for the uh, final relief line as you can see in front of you. Um, so the space over to the left hand side is going to be where the branch line is going to be. Um, now the branch line is its own separate line so I'm going to have it spaced a little bit further away from the relief lines in a similar way to the gap here between the relief and the main lines. And to do that on a corner of a fixed, um, fixed or a variable radius I've just been using a uh, spacer, in this case a piece of cork and a pen. And you can see I now have a line to tell me where to put the cork for this line. Along here you can see I've marked out where the branch line will be in relation to the platform. So obviously it's got to be spaced away quite a bit. Um, I've got those two pieces of wood over there which are my jig for the approximate width of a platform. So you can see I've made a mark there. So that puts the branch line further away than it is on the corner. So what I've done is what I've done on the whole layout in various places is utilised a flexible thin strip of plywood and that then makes a nice gradual curve to indicate where the line should go to then close up and meet back where my pen line is over here. So you can see I've marked around there and now we have a nice smooth transition into the station. Okay, well the, uh, the video is getting on a bit now and I think you've pretty much got the idea for what the process is. Um, so I have taken the liberty of fast forwarding uh, a number of weeks and as you can see I've now completed the bulk of the track work. I'm very pleased with how things are looking. Sleeper spacing was certainly worth the effort. It does look a lot better and more importantly it matches the branch line. You see how the, uh, the spacing on there is similar on there. It's not exactly the same. There were differences, but uh, certainly straight out of the box it looked way too wrong. 
control on the layout for the time being will just be conventional DCC using the existing lens system which has served me well for many years now. Um, I've just made a little box that holds the command station and uh, just sort of uh, Frenched it into the uh, the front of the baseboard there. It looks reasonably okay I suppose. It's not particularly professional but it's alright. I've mounted the uh, power supply just up on the uh, side of the baseboard frames. Again it's very handy having this design of baseboard frames. Bits and pieces can be mounted directly to it quite easily. I've also connected up some of the dropper wires to the bus. I've not uh, connected all of them, that's going to take quite a bit longer, but certainly enough to get things running um, have been uh, soldered in. Um, previously I've used um, suitcase connectors and uh, spade connectors um, together um, to connect to the bus wires. This time I've decided to solder. It's just a personal preference, it's entirely up to you how you connect up the bus wires. I did the connectors, they worked well, but I didn't think they looked particularly professional or very nice, so I'm trying out soldering this time. Both are working, it's just a matter of choice which one you do. I'll just quickly uh, talk to you through a couple of things I've done with the uh, branch line. Uh, so it's using bullhead track, and uh, one thing I've done is I've cut all of the uh, lengths of flexi into 60 foot panels. Um, that was quite common to find track in 60 foot panels, so that means there's a joiner there, and then we move a scale 60 foot down the line, and there's another joiner there, and then we keep going, and then hopefully you can make it out and see there's another joiner there with the dropper wires attached as well, and then we carry on down the track, there's another joiner over there. So you end up with the track connected in these quite short lengths, but uh, doing so is quite realistic as uh, the panels were transported in 60 foot lengths because that's what would fit on the wagons of the period. I could have just laid it straight down in uh, continuous you know, standard flexi lengths but uh, just to make things a little bit more realistic and get that classic clickety clack noise as the trains going down the branch line I've elected to uh, do 60 foot track panels. Then after that what I've done is I've connected them together and I've connected four panels together which creates the, the original flexi length that I started with but with some added joiners for realism and by doing that um, I've created some potential areas where I could uh, lose electrical uh, conductivity between the various pieces so what I've done is solder the joiners on the four sections or four panels and then I only need one set of bus wires or one set of dropper wires so we end up with four panels soldered together with a set of wires and then there's another four panels soldered together with a set of wires. So it kind of reduces the uh, the amount of cabling I need, only having a, a dropper every few feet or so. The branch line just stops here at the moment. I will continue to lay it um, in another video, but uh, for now I'm going to uh, wrap this video up. Um, all of the, uh, the main and relief lines are laid so uh, can get things running again finally. Okay well that concludes the how-to part of the video as you can hear the trains are now running again which is a welcome noise to my ears it's been a lot of effort to respace all the sleepers and get all the track laid would have been a lot quicker if I just put it straight down but I know with uh, the passage of time I wouldn't have been happy with it so I'm relieved that it's now finished but also glad that I took the, uh, the time to do it and that obviously explains the uh, delay in getting this video out due to the amount of work that was required to get everything ready. So uh, hopefully you enjoyed the video and got a few ideas, hints and tips. I appreciate that the content of the video is not for everybody and there are certain things you're not interested in doing. But uh, all the same, hopefully you've got at least one idea out of it. So I'll see you again in the, uh, the next video which should hopefully be along quite a bit sooner than this one took to come out.
Thanks for watching the video. If you liked what you saw, you can see more Everard Junction videos by clicking on the left. You can click on the right and check out Dean Park Station, another excellent model railway set in Scotland in the 1980s.